blind cave fish are cool. I keep going back to blind cave fish. I guess that's going to be the motif of this uh, podcast. <laughs> you know. Seasons greetings, listeners. Prescription Sound, episode 16. And this is your favorite and only host, Drew, back at it. If you're any kind of curious person and maybe someone who wants to know how to communicate more effectively, then you're going to love today's show. You've likely heard of the educational organization TED, and you may very well have watched a TED talk or two in the past. Well, today I speak with David Biello, the man that decides the who, the what, the how, the where, and the when of every science TED talk. So let's dive right in and find out what it was about David's background that made him the ideal candidate to be the TED Scientific Curator. I got my epic start in journalism via trade publications. These are niche uh, publications that target a very specific demographic. The one that I first started working for was called Environmental Finance. I'm sure all of your listeners subscribe. Uh, It was. (laughs) We'll put it in the show notes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was about uh, the nascent uh, carbon markets, really. I mean, and many other markets beside, but I was covering the carbon market. So these were a- attempts to trade um, pollution permits under the Kyoto Protocol and various other national schemes to cut down on climate change pollution. And from there, I moved into, uh, let's say, more general publications. So everything from women's magazines like uh, Elle and Glamour mm. to uh, uh, more staid publications like uh, like the New York Times. Generally, writing about science because very quickly, the English majors around me figured out that I wasn't afraid of uh, numbers or scientific jargon. And then after many years of, uh, of being a freelancer, I was kind of looking for a more stable environment and ended up at Scientific American, which is actually the oldest continually published magazine in the United States mm. uh, since 1845. So that's pretty stable. Uh, wore a number of different hats there, ending up as one of the environment and energy editors there, again, covering climate change uh, all around the world. One of the things that's interesting about Scientific American is that you're supposed to be hearing from the experts themselves. So when you're editing a feature article, you're actually collaborating uh, directly with the scientists involved in the research often. And oh, cool. uh, I didn't think about that much at the time, but that turned out to be kind of one of the best forms of training for the job I'm in now uh, at TED uh, that I could have possibly imagined. Yeah, it's an amazing background, and I, it must have given you such a, uh, a range in your journalistic skill set, you know, going between uh, Glamour magazines to then um, Scientific American <laughs> with the yeah, content well, when you're a and the depth. You have to just take whatever job you can get. Yeah, That's, I can uh, imagine. The reality of uh, journalism. And then as you got involved with TED, I mean, how did that come about? Because this doesn't seem like a job that you um, you typically just apply for. So, I mean, did they yeah. choose you? How did that How did that come about? Yes, they did uh, choose me. It wasn't exactly, you know, like they reached out and were like, hey, David Biello, come join us at TED. No. Um, so I'd been at Scientific American, as I mentioned, for about a decade, actually more than a decade. And uh, I was ready for some new challenges. I've been able to do a lot of different kinds of things at, at uh, Scientific American, uh, like podcasts, some video series, and done some documentaries with, uh, with TBS. Uh, and I heard from a friend that Ted was looking for a science curator. I thought that the odds of me getting that um, as a journalist might be rather low. Um, but it turns out, well, A, they apparently liked me, and B, being a journalist, which means kind of being a quick study in a wide variety of things, yeah. Um, is actually key to being a, a curator for one of these specializations at TED because you have to be a quick study. So I'm responsible for everything from astrophysics to zoology. I have a PhD in none of those uh, disciplines, so I have to kind of quickly get up to speed on whatever it may be, quantum mechanics, conservation prospects of axolotls in Mexico, and everything in between. So uh, being a journalist who can kind of quickly get up to speed is uh, good training. I guess that's why they thought they should hire me. Right. Yeah, I mean, it does make sense because science is so specialized anyway that it's tempting to think that it has to be a scientist. But, you know, you're not going to necessarily be very well versed in all these uh, different subjects. That's exactly right. And actually, one of the biggest ways that scientists get into trouble uh, on the TED stage and, and elsewhere is when they start to 
speculate or opine on subjects outside their uh, expertise. And speaking of those specialist topics and then the people themselves, what is it that you are looking for generally when it comes to putting someone up on that TED stage? You know, is it a novel idea? Is it the person? Do they do they have to be um, kind of a thought leader in that field? And, and is it the impact as well of the potential subject? Yeah, I think uh, for me personally, and I think if you asked all the different curators here, there, there might be slightly different answers. For me personally, it starts with the idea. Uh, and I'll tell you why you are not a great speaker, but you have a brilliant idea, you know, I can help you kind of showcase that brilliant idea and I can help make you a better speaker. If you are a brilliant speaker and you have no good ideas, I can't give you one. So it it really starts uh, with the idea and hopefully kind of both the novelty and breadth of that idea, but it doesn't have to be you know, I would, I would argue that we often do kind of ideas that, that folks might find surprising. So sometimes what I'm really looking for is the passion of the speaker themselves for the subject at hand. Um, and one of the examples I like to give here is a talk about uh, blind cavefish, which I feel like most listeners or viewers are going to kind of see that in the headline and be like, blind cavefish? I don't care about blind cavefish. <laughs> you know, or what relevance do blind cavefish have to my life? But if you watch even like a minute of that talk, you will be sucked in by the speaker's passion and, until you are like, oh, my God, I'm obsessed with blind cavefish. And so that is a very neat trick, and I like to try to pull that off whenever I can. Part of my job is to try to help people understand that science is, is for all of us, and, and it can be accessible for all of us and also should be accessible for all of us, that there is no reason for it to be kind of kept away from uh, from people. And that seems to be, I feel like, even more rewarding in a way when it's something that seems very abstract on the surface, but the skill of the speaker uh, means that they can kind of manipulate it and, and make it very, very relevant to our lives and, and why it's important. And I think, <laughs> I think I've, I and many other people have sat through scientific talks um, where it's the opposite, where it's <laughs> very high impact, important findings, and yet the the passion just doesn't come through uh, from the speaker, and it's right. kind of a shame. Well, it's literally the opposite of how scientists are trained. So uh, as someone studied some chemistry in, in college, uh, you know, you're trained to be objective, to kind of remove yourself as much as possible, to present uh, your findings in as dispassionate a way as possible. A TED Talk is quite honestly, the opposite of that. We want to know the when, the where, the why, the how of what engaged you first about uh, chemistry and whatever it might be. Let's say you're obsessed with metal organic frameworks, right? Which sounds very jargony and dense and, and whatever. But there, there is a human reason why you got into moths. And it might be because, hey, you think this holds the key to storing energy better so we can solve our climate challenges. Or it might be that uh, you just love the kind of intricate architecture of these uh, of these molecules, kind of like building Legos. Um, but there's always going to be that kind of human story behind the science. And so my job is to tap into that and expose that. Yeah, this science communication is so, so important. And we're always trying to improve on that here at Scripps Research as well. So what makes a good TED Talk then in practice? You know, what are the big do's and don'ts? How do you make someone a better speaker? Could you kind of demystify all of that for us? <laughs> well, the first thing to think about is that there are many different ways of being a good speaker. Uh, and I mentioned one of the key ones, which is your passion. One of the other keys is to speak in plain uh, English. There is always a temptation to kind of slip into the jargon of your sub discipline um, so that even uh, a chemist can't necessarily understand the jargon of an astrophysicist. Now, we don't want to simplify to the point of absurdity uh, and certainly not to the point of being factually incorrect. So there is a delicate balance to be struck there, but certainly getting rid of those distancing jargon words is important. You're not giving this TED Talk to your four colleagues in evolutionary biology who are equally obsessed with blind cavefish. You are giving this TED Talk to an entire world of people who have never heard of blind cavefish. Uh, so you better bring them along with you. And that's, I guess, the other big key is oftentimes speakers 
come to these opportunities as an opportunity uh, for them. But it, actually, that's looking at it in the exact wrong way. You're there to help the audience. It's about the audience and what they're going to take away right. uh, from this information. Now, that will serve to show everyone uh, how great your science is and, and all the rest of it. So it's, it's counterintuitive in that way. But if you don't put the audience first, um, you've already failed before you even get up there. I often see things go sideways when the ego gets the upper hand. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, you know, I'm not saying like, yes, absolutely, you should be proud of your accomplishments and you should, you know, highlight the amazing science that you've done. But it's really about leaving the audience with a key idea, whatever that might be. Once you've done this, given a TED Talk and, and gone through this particular process and, and training, um, you have that mm -hmm. to apply to any other talk you'll ever have to do. Uh, which will both reduce nerves and just make you uh, a much, much better speaker. Sure. And, and on that point with the nerves, you think you mentioned and other people have said that whole process and, and going through the TED Talk and being up on that stage can be very nervy. So why do you think that is? What is it about that stage? Man, I wish I knew. Because <laughs> one of the, the key things that I would love to do, and I've been doing this for three years, is to kind of... Uh, take a little bit of that uh, pressure off. I was about to say I've never met anyone who wasn't nervous. What I will say is I have met a few people who weren't nervous, and they should have been. It makes me nervous if you're not nervous. Um, there's, uh, or there's something kind of radically wrong. Uh, but 99% of people, and I'm including people who like speak professionally for a living, get nervous when they need to step into that red circle and uh, and the spotlight goes on them. I don't know exactly what it is. Maybe it's the color red. Uh, maybe it's the kind of short time frame, right? Maybe they're used to speaking for an hour or whatever it may be, and now they got to try to get it across in, in 10 minutes. Maybe it's the singular focus without any shield like a podium or a lectern or whatever else it might be. I don't quite know. That's a big part of the challenge is actually helping people kind of cope with those, with those nerves and, and, and recognize that, you know what, there are two things that help with that. One is, uh, again, thinking about your audience first and actually making a connection with them. So it sounds sort of counterintuitive to an introvert like myself, but actually making eye contact with your audience will help kind of calm you down. And two, keeping in mind the fact that the audience really does want to learn from you. The people who watch uh, TED Talks both in person and online are kind of curious and engaged, mm. and they may not have kind of the formal scientific training, which is why no jargon, uh, but they really do want to learn. And so they, it's a friendly, receptive audience, and I think people forget that, right? And yeah. They think like, oh, the audience is waiting for me to fail. No, 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 no. They're waiting for you to succeed. And so if, if, if I could just get people to believe me, then that might help. Um, but yeah, I'm open to any and all suggestions for how to de-escalate the nerves there a little bit. Yeah, well, hopefully people will listen to this and it might help yeah, prospective speakers there in the future. Go. Yeah, no, yeah. it's a good point. I mean, these people should be thought of as allies, right, who are watching these talks and um, very curious. That's right. and It's the opposite of a scientific audience, right? When you're speaking to your peers, they are looking to tear down your arguments and... Uh, <laughs> find the, the holes in your logic or your data or whatever else. So I get it, yeah. right? That's, that's particular to this domain, science, right? But that's not the TED audience. And I love what you said about the eye contact thing, and I found that as well with my own communication. It does seem counterintuitive, but it kind of just focuses your attention when you can actually look at one person in the eye, and then you also see someone as just an individual rather than seeing the whole crowd, which can be very intimidating. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. If, you, if you're doing that kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's almost like a lawn sprinkler where you're just kind of spraying the audience with eye contact, but never really mm. kind of diving in with one person. And I'm not saying lock eyes with one person in the audience and deliver your whole TED Talk to one person, but kind of making eye contact with some individuals. And so I turn to you and make eye contact and I deliver a sentence or, or even a whole paragraph of the talk uh, to you and then turning to the other side of the audience and delivering the next section to them really does help you feel more grounded, less nervous, and just connects you to the audience. And you can actually see their faces like, oh, 
I'm, I'm so excited to hear from this person. Yeah, it gives you feedback. Yeah. David constantly has his eyes and ears open for the next big ideas, which he often finds out about from nominations by scientific peers, affiliated research institutes, or even the researchers themselves. Once these people have been identified, that's when the real work begins in getting them ready for the stage. In an ideal world, you know, we kind of settle on the speaker and the idea six months before the event, whether that's a small event or a big event. That's one of the reasons why, honestly, TED Talks end up being so effective is they take a lot of work. One of the things that I think is uh, not widely appreciated and, and usually a, a red flag for me is, is folks who are like, oh, I give talks all the time. You know, I'll just show up and, uh, and, and, and give a TED Talk and this will be extra easy because, you know, instead of having to fill an hour, I only have to fill 10 minutes. Well, guess what? Shorter is actually harder <laughs> because you just you don't get to kind of backfill in any of the missing information later in your lecture or, or whatever else it may be. You have to be really focused and precise and engaging and, and compelling uh, in those 10 minutes if you want to leave people with the idea that you are trying to spread. And uh, that's hard work. Um, and so you've got to be willing to put in that effort. That's the six months. Um, so there'll be some sense of what the idea is. Um, that can often change, right? Like uh, it'll be reshaped slightly. We're really looking to almost distill the talk down to its essence in kind of this is the idea worth spreading. This is what you want to leave in your audience's uh, mind. And then ev once you have that, everything in the talk is viewed through that lens. So everything should be uh, building towards or explaining that core idea. Now, there are many different ways to approach that. It could just be kind of a straight-ahead talk. It could be a mystery talk. There are many different ways to kind of craft a scientific narrative. So let's say uh, several months in, we've got that. We've got kind of a rough script, if you will. Then we do uh, fact-check the said script, and we're off to the more uh, like what it will be like on stage aspects. And I don't want to say memorizing Although for some people, that is exactly what they do. They do memorize it word for word um, because that helps them, I don't know, feel more comfortable up there. But what I aim for is more memorizing the beats of the talk. And the reason I say that is because the goal here is to be more conversational, let's say, than your average talk. You're really trying to share something uh, with the audience. And the way I like to think about it is, well, kind of like you and I are chatting right now, but maybe with, uh, I don't know, a beer. So it's, you're telling your curious, engaged, non-scientist friend about your research over a beer in a bar. I might be drinking beer right now, David. <laughs> ah, that's true. I don't know. <laughs> that is a good point. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's this. It's a very kind of conversational approach. And yes, you are talking to an audience. And so maybe there isn't the same kind of ebb and flow as, as we get to have here. Yeah. But uh, the goal is to have that kind of like, oh my gosh. I had the most amazing day at work today. Hmm. Uh, I got to tell you all about blind cave fish. Here's what I've learned. And you're off to the races. So when it comes to um, TED and, and the organization itself, people will be familiar with that, but they also be familiar with um, some of the smaller TEDx events. So I was wondering if you That's could right. just very quickly give us the distinction between those, because I believe they're not the same. You are correct. They are not the same. So uh, there's the main kind of TED conference, which started it all, and it stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. I'm mm. still a little sad that science isn't in there, but I think we actually underlay everything that is in the acronym. And uh, TEDx is something that started about 10 years ago exactly, actually. As I understand it, it really started as kind of folks who were so inspired by the TED events that they were like, I want to do this in my hometown. And so they would go back to wherever they were from, let's say TEDx Sydney or TEDx Almaty in Kazakhstan. Uh, you know, these are places all around the world, and they would put on uh, a TED style event. And so TEDx kind of grew up to serve that need, and it has truly exploded. There's now something like 10 TEDx events every day somewhere around the world. Oh, wow. And the power of TEDx is that, unlike us at TED, we're kind of English language, not exclusively, but primarily, these events are done in, in local languages, in local contexts, and address issues that are relevant in a way that, uh, that we can't, right? We do, I do strive for, for global reach and, 
you know, trying to understand kind of the latest and greatest in science in, in Kazakhstan or wherever. But, uh, I, you know, I'm just one guy based in New York, um, and so I'm certainly not going to know everything there is on offer, but yeah. a local organizer is. Sure. No, it's great for accessibility, and it really helps instill some of those other positive habits with science communication, um, you know, from the main That's right. TED organization. That's so. exactly right. I'm curious, is there much crosstalk between you and the other TED curators from other fields, you know, so like business, technology. I almost imagine you all sitting around a table at dinner parties. Your your imagination is correct, uh, although it's usually not a dinner party. It's usually, a, you know, a conference room table. Uh, well, first of all, there's a lot of crossover, right? Like, is this idea business or is it science? Mm. Let's say it's some synthetic biology company. Uh, you know, the chief scientific officer wants to come and give a talk about yeast. Is that a science talk and therefore I should be working with them? Or is it a business talk because mm. it's a business? Honestly, we're very collegial. Uh, so sometimes it's a business talk and sometimes it's a, a science talk and it just sort of depends. But the way that it works in terms of vetting the ideas is we all go into a room with Chris Anderson, who's the head of TED, uh, and Helen Walters, who's our head of curation, and all of us kind of uh, specialists, and we, you know, pitch our ideas and our speakers. And, you know, sometimes you get everybody super excited about those, uh, and sometimes you don't. Uh, and then we'll just kind of hash it out. What I will say, hope my uh, bosses don't listen to this podcast, is that I uh, rarely give up <laughs> on a speaker or an idea. So... <laughs> If I pitch them in, in one context and in one way and it doesn't work out, I often bring them back, you know, for another event and maybe a, a, a slightly different angle on the idea. Do you have a favorite TED Talk of all time? And if, can you can you say it? <laughs> oh, man. That's like asking me to choose a favorite child. And uh, I'm not sure. I Honestly, it's usually <laughs> the last TED Talk that mm -hmm. I saw uh, it. or worked on. Uh, so right now, I'm super fond of a whole bunch of TED Talks that came out of TED at NAS. Those are not online yet, so I will go back to the event uh, right before that. The first of these talks has posted, and it's definitely one of my favorites because, first of all, it's a subject that I think we can all relate to. It's the neuroscience of taste uh, and our experience wow. of food. Um, so you're really kind of engaged right off the bat. Yeah. Um, and second of all, it's told to you by this incredibly charming and funny woman from Denmark, Camilla uh, Anderson. And she just has this lovely kind of dry sense of humor and yet is con conveying some of the things that we're learning about how our conscious and subconscious experience of food are so kind of radically different. So go mm -hmm. check that out uh, online. That's my current top pick. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I definitely will check that out. What are the current and future areas uh, going forward of science that excite you the most, would you say? Interesting. Uh, given my background, which you heard at the top, I'm yeah. always obsessed with what we're going to do about climate change. Um, and that could be anything from the genetic modification of plants to help us uh, pull CO2 back out of the air like they've been doing for billions of years, uh, to kind of the social science of psychological hurdles to action on climate change. So I, that, unfortunately, is going to be with us uh, for a yeah. long time. So that is definitely one that I, I... Excited is the wrong word. One that I'm uh, working on at all times. Sure. Then I am super obsessed with microbes. For careful watchers of the science section of, uh, of TED, they may have noticed a massive uptick in talks about ocean microbes and just a variety of the, the microbes in your shower head, you name it, I'm into the microbes. Uh, and so I don't think that's going to change. That really leads into another area that I think is super interesting, which is synthetic biology and right. kind of the, the new tools that are really making it incredibly possible for us to manipulate really life in ways uh, that we never have before. And then all the discoveries of what's going on out there in the universe, whether that might be something close to home, like missing planets in the solar system and whether they exist or not, yeah. or what, what the heck is dark matter and, uh, and are we ever going to figure out uh, what it is, let alone dark energy. Don't get me started on dark energy. So oh, those, no. are, 
I mean, and I could I could keep going. I could keep going, but we I'm need another hour because, for that, dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I there are many many things that I get excited about in science. Yeah, me too. And I I really do envy your job because it does sound fantastic. It's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna lie. It's it's pretty yeah. fun. I mean, it's stressful too. Sure. But uh, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, I can't complain either because I get to do things like this. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems pretty sweet. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. Your job seems pretty fun too. Yeah, it's amazing. So maybe we'll wrap things up with my final roundup question, which I love to throw at all of my guests. Which is, you know, if you could give that one piece of advice or your golden piece of wisdom to anyone in in work, career progression, you know, life, self improvement, what would it be and why? Man. Uh, so this is a tough one for me, but I think I'm going to have to default to my Midwestern upbringing. It's uh, uh, be kind. Oh, yeah. um, you know, be, be kind to the people uh, around you. You never really know what they're going through. And also, you never really know where your career path is going to take you. And if you kind of are as kind as you can be to everyone around you, then when your you know, former intern becomes your boss, you may be better off. There it is, folks. Great advice on how to be a better communicator and so many exciting areas of science worth following. Many thanks to David for the wisdom and the laughs today on the show. In the show notes, we'll have links to David on social media, as well as to his book, The Unnatural World. So you'll definitely want to go and check that out. And if you had fun and you like what we're doing here at Scripps Research, please remember to go ahead and subscribe, leave a review and follow us on the interwebs. We'll be back again soon with more audio shenanigans, so stay tuned. Thank you all for listening as always. Be kind and take care.